Welcome back everybody to another episode of Direct Comparison. In today's episode, we're going to take an extended look at the new Tomb Raider Remastered Collection and see how it stacks up to the original 90s games in terms of their graphic quality, art direction, and included features. Because the Remastered Collection has its own built-in graphics toggle hotkey that can be activated at any time, I'll be referring to the classic mode graphics included in the collection itself, as Aspire and Saber did a fantastic job of preserving the original games in their entirety, blocky, polygonal, chested Lara and all. However, it is important to note that while this classic mode is nearly identical to what you may have played back in the day, it has been tweaked a little bit too, with things like a native 4K resolution, the missing musical scores from the PlayStation versions added back in, the mid-air somersault maneuver from Tomb Raider 2 retroactively added to Tomb Raider 1, and cleaned up performance. As John Linman over at Digital Foundry put it, the classic mode here is more of a idealized version of those classic games, cleaning up the rougher edges and unifying the trilogy into one cohesive package, without any of the hassle of having to install a bunch of mods or tweaks to get them all running properly. But today, we're not going to focus on all those little changes that were made to the classic graphics scheme. Instead, we're going to focus our attention on the new remastered graphics mode, including how it benefits the series' presentation, and in some cases, how they may even hurt them. Now, usually at this point I would tell you what graphics settings that I'm using for this analysis, but as it turns out, this collection literally has no graphical settings at all. The game will run at a native 4K resolution regardless of what graphical mode you decide to play in, assuming your screen supports it of course. Though it's worth noting that the remastered visual style will bump the game's performance up to 60fps on consoles, and even up to 120fps on PC too, and is not at all demanding and should look about the same across all platforms. The classic visual style on the other hand will run at a hard-locked 30fps as it always has, only now at a 4K resolution. And, unlike the old, modded versions of those same games, the HUD elements are now properly scaled with this higher resolution too. But before we get into all of that, let's kick this comparison off by first talking about the star of the adventure, Lara Croft. Lara, as you can plainly see, has undergone quite an extensive overhaul with the remaster, ditching her old polygons for something more akin to the version of Croft shown in the game's many FMV sequences. For this reason, her appearance is not necessarily going to be the most realistic character model released this year. In fact, it's not even technically as impressive as the models we saw in the early 2000s games like Angel of Darkness, Legend, Anniversary, and Underworld. Though, when considering the intended direction and style of this collection, I think Aspire made the right decision here. Lara looks phenomenal in the remaster, with a much higher poly count, rounded edges, and even new animations like blinking, looking, and fingers on her hands that will extend and curl when reaching out and grabbing ledges. All the original outfits seen throughout the trilogy are retained here too, from her classic shorts and blue tank, to the wetsuit, snow jacket, cat suit, and bathrobe. It's all there, and aside from making her tube top in the South Pacific stage a tiny bit less revealing, it doesn't look like many artistic liberties were taken with these designs either. One minor change fans may notice is that Lara's old yellow headband in her hair has been removed. This was done to more properly realize the version of Lara shown in the cinematics, as the headband was only ever present in-game, as a way to visually separate her ponytail from the back of her head. Speaking of which, the physics applied to Lara's signature braid have also been updated, with more animation bones throughout to make the movement more fluid and natural. The only downside here is that, for whatever reason, the hair has this unnatural breathing effect now, that causes the balls of the braid to shrink and expand as Lara breathes. This never used to happen with the old six-point node braid, so hopefully Aspire can make some tweaks to fix this visual oddity. In addition to Lara herself, all her equipment has been cleaned up with the remaster too. What previously were very basic, low-poly combinations of rectangles are now properly realized real-world firearms with intricate detail that, while still faithful to the original designs, are much more recognizable as a result. 
these objects are also fully rendered in the environment now too, rather than the previous 2D sprites. And when the player picks these items up, they'll smoothly rotate in the corner of the screen, similar to the animation first introduced with Tomb Raider 3 back in 98. The HUD elements similarly have been cleaned up for the remaster, with proper scaling accompanying the 4K resolution, unlike older versions of the game on PC, where forcing a 4K resolution through mods often caused the HUD elements like health bars to shrink. Additionally, the developers added in a few new quality of life features too, including new interact prompts to help players new to the series know when a switch or item can be interacted with, and new health bars for the bigger boss fights that make it much more clear when certain enemies are taking damage, as that was sometimes not properly translated in the past. For fans looking for a more authentic experience, those interact prompts and the auto walk feature for interacting with items can be disabled. Though strangely, the boss health bars cannot be turned off, so it would be nice to see a toggle added in a later update. Even still, all the changes to the equipment and menu systems look great, and all while staying consistent with the visual aesthetic throughout. The only items that I felt were a little disappointing were some of those featured in Tomb Raider 3. The shotgun, for example, has been made universal across all three games, matching the old Mossberg pump action. However, in the original Tomb Raider 3, the shotgun is modeled after the Spaz 12, a design that does not return. Another change was made to the four main artifacts found throughout Tomb Raider 3, as their original blue-green transparent texture is now more of a hardened opaque green that isn't as visually interesting. I also wanted to point out that there were several instances, especially in the original Tomb Raider, where important key items are almost impossible to see now when using the remastered graphics, due to changes made to both the item itself and the surrounding environment. These gray keys in the grease levels, for example, were nearly invisible, causing me to completely miss them and run around aimlessly for an hour, unsure of what to do to progress. This happened about two or three more times throughout these stages, but interestingly, the issue wasn't as widespread as I feared, as later key items were not only much easier to spot against the environment, but were even comically larger. Then, of course, we can't forget the enemies. Tomb Raiders 1 through 3 have a remarkably large collection of different enemies to gun down, from ferocious predatory animals like bats, wolves, bears, and lions, to dinosaurs, yetis, alien mutants, and fire-breathing dragons. The enemies are one of the classic series' most exciting assets, as the original developers' core design loved to surprise players with the unexpected around every corner. And thankfully, every single one of these foes has been given a proper touch-up to bring them into the 21st century, with new, cleaner models complete with higher resolution textures, normal maps to give some of those textures more depth, and higher poly counts to hide the obvious animation nodes. The enemies do still behave the same as they always have, so you can expect all the wonky behavior when fighting at close range along with all the environmental clipping for the larger enemies and weird, unnatural movement. And unlike Lara, the remodels here aren't nearly as drastic of an overhaul, preserving their quirky designs and proportions almost exactly. This bear, for example, still has this boxy-looking head, as if a child had drawn it, though the angles and proportions have been tweaked slightly. And of course, all of its textures have been updated and the poly count has been expanded. Some creatures like the tigers have new normal maps applied, giving their body more of a furry look. And enemies with more intricate details like sharp teeth are now more properly rendered and consistent across the board, meaning the T-Rex in Tomb Raider 1 will be more in line with the quality of the much more intricate T-Rex used in Tomb Raider 3. The only enemy models that even slightly miss the mark are the various human enemies and miscellaneous characters that you'll encounter throughout each game. The design of the human faces feels really strange with these remasters, almost like each of these hardened mercenaries is a dressed up Ken doll playing opposite to Lara's Barbie. I can understand wanting to match the style with the FMV version of Lara, but a lot of the small, low res detail and personality that was drawn directly onto those old, ugly mafiosos and soldiers feels lost in translation here, with these bright, pretty, and really plastic looking faces. 
The muscle definition on some of these beefy looking mafia enemies in Tomb Raider 2 in particular highlights the issue even more, as the muscle that was previously baked into the texture of the model is now actually rendered in 3D. And because they lack the dark lines that accentuated these exaggerated muscles before, the characters themselves just feel off. Also, it's worth noting here that because Aspire elected to use all the old core designed animations throughout, including those in the in-engine cinematics, the interactions between Lara and these human characters looks very bizarre. Lara's new model will often clip through itself and the environment, as the animations were intended for the original models. And because those original models couldn't open their mouths to speak, their heads were designed to bob around to show when they were speaking, a design that is retained here and looks especially weird when considering that the characters' mouths and lips do move now with these newer models. All the old jankiness from the cinematics are in place too, like the unnatural physics and hilariously awkward moments like this one. Though it is cool that even during the cinematics, you can tap the graphic toggle button and see the original core designed version and how they were intended to look. The FMVs work the same way too, with the ability to toggle between the original and the new versions. Though the new FMVs appear to have only received a 4K AI upscaling solution. This often results in a lot of weird artifacting that wasn't present in the original versions. And for whatever reason, the FMVs are also significantly darker than those same FMVs played on the original PlayStation hardware. Once you get to Tomb Raider 2 and 3, these FMVs do look a bit better, but it's a shame Aspire couldn't have found a way to give us fully remade FMVs to accompany the reworked gameplay visuals. Next up, let's talk environments. The environments in the remastered Tomb Raider collection are fascinating, as Aspire has elected to preserve each and every location exactly in order to maintain the game's core gameplay flow. For those of you unfamiliar with how these games work, Tomb Raider's level environments are built via a network of grid-based geometry, with the ability to adjust the height of each vertice independently. This means in one room you might have a lot of these flat rectangles. or you can elect to design a room with more complexity, with angled rectangular columns and slopes. These are then surfaced with texture maps that help to define that space, and set each level apart from one another based on specific themes. And additional, more complex object models are then sprinkled over top to help expand on those themes. By today's standards, these environments obviously look extremely dated, but Tomb Raider's gameplay is also specifically built around this grid system, making it impossible for these levels to look any other way. A standing jump forward, for example, can be used to clear exactly two squares in the grid, assuming the height levels are the same. A running jump, on the other hand, can clear up to three squares. And combining a running jump with a grab will allow Lara to grab the edge of a fourth square and pull herself up. Once you combine things like height differences, unique angles, slopes, and doing multiple consecutive jumps, it all gets even more complex, but at the same time, remains consistent. And once you understand it all, the series' platforming becomes this really unique and interesting series of climbing puzzles that more modern adventure games completely lack in favor of just pushing the stick forward along a wall. So with that in mind, the environments from a geometry perspective are virtually identical between the remaster and the original classic games, with the only minor exceptions to this being the occasional new decorative cracks in the ceiling used to complement the reworked lighting design. This means that every jump, every trap, every obstacle, and every deadly fall are all retained exactly the same. Even all the same little bugs and glitches from the original games still work, like the corner glitch to get on top of Lara's mansion. Only now, every single surface of literally every wall, floor, and ceiling has been updated using much higher quality texture maps, often bringing with it a level of depth never before seen in these games. Rocky cave walls, ice, dirt, metal, concrete, all of it looks so much better than before. And what's more, these retextures are all remarkably faithful to the original designs, even if those original designs may have been out of place or didn't blend very well before. This is especially noticeable when traveling through the more natural caves and forested areas, 
where certain textures may appear stretched or not lined up properly with the same textures next to them. It's identical to the way the old textures functioned, for better or for worse. There are a few exceptions to this, however. Some textured surfaces, mainly the interiors of buildings with paintings hanging on the wall, have been reimagined a bit, using more recognizable paintings that somewhat match the original intent. But even these feel very consistent with that original art style, and are great additions that really help to add to the immersiveness of these locations. Another major change to the environments is the overhaul made to the various object models. In the original games, mainly the first two Tomb Raiders, important decorative objects were often incorporated into levels in the form of 2D sprites. These usually had no impact on the gameplay, and were only incorporated to try and explain what the room was supposed to be that you were platforming through, like this mummy, or the various pots and pans along the edges of this room. In the remaster, every one of these 2D sprites has been reimagined as a full 3D model. Additional 3D models have also been added at times, though never enough to detract from the isolated feel of the original vision. Some of the more impressive model updates can be found when looking at things like the Sphinx in the Egypt levels, or the Dragon Heads in the Temple of Zion that sport far more geometric complexity and add a great deal to the believability of their respective areas. I especially love the addition of all the dense vegetation throughout, especially in the India and South Pacific chapters of Tomb Raider 3, as they completely transform locations that previously relied on sporadic sprite placement to sell the illusion of dense jungles. At the same time, this does make some of the platforming in these levels a bit more challenging, especially when hopping around on the tree branches above, as the densely packed tree canopies will often hide obvious climbable surfaces that were perfectly visible before. Thankfully, these added details never will physically block Lara either, and are only decorative, with no collision attached. Another great revamp comes with Tomb Raider 2's Opera House level, before, this level's nighttime theme was basically only realized by changing the sky to a black skybox and tweaking the lighting effects slightly. But now, a bunch of new object models have been incorporated here to contribute to the theme, including outdoor lanterns and bistro lights, along with a massive chandelier inside the opera house itself. It looks great and does a much better job of showing the player what exactly this collection of squares and rectangles is trying to represent. In addition to new models and textures, the remaster also adds with it brand new skyboxes for each environment, which is especially noticeable in the original Tomb Raider, as that game had no skyboxes at all. This is a big deal, as this will drastically impact the look and feel of each respective environment. The Lost Valley in particular was always intended to take place outside during the day. Though, players in the 90s likely remember it all taking place inside a large cave, or even at night, due to the pitch black skybox and black fog. In preserving that original feel, Aspire elected to compromise with the Lost Valley, and added in a skybox with heavy cloud coverage, keeping the infamous T-Rex sequence dark and moody, while also enhancing it and bringing it more in line with Core Design's original intended vision. Most of the other skyboxes look great too, usually sticking to the original vision as well. Though, with the largely improved draw distances, I did find some locations, like the Himalayan chapters in Tomb Raider 2 and the Nevada Desert chapters in Tomb Raider 3, to not feel quite as cavernous and weirdly isolated, which was not the case with the original skyboxes, due to the height and placement around the playable area. There's so much more I'd love to talk about when it comes to these environments, as I've played these games countless times and know them very well. But instead of spending hours talking about every little detail, here's a small taste of what some of these locations from each game look like when stacked up side by side.
So you probably noticed from those side-by-sides that a lot of the changes between these two versions has less to do with the new textures and object models and more to do with the remaster's totally reimagined lighting. When playing in the remastered visual mode, each of the three Tomb Raider games now utilize real-time lighting effects, often using light probes placed in clever locations, usually with changes to the level geometry to indicate things like sunlight pouring into the room. Originally, these games made extensive use of baked lighting effects, with most of the shadowing being put in place manually. The remaster's lighting is both beautiful and problematic at the same time. For the most part, it does look great, making areas that previously appeared overly bright, flat, and lifeless feel more cinematic and realistic, with light shafts pouring down into dimly lit caves and temples and properly illuminating areas in direct contact while casting occluded areas into darkness. All the new light shafts have been baked in, and I don't recall there being any volumetric lighting effects. But the overall look and feel here is great, finding the perfect balance between preserving the original intent of each location, while also making each area feel like it arguably should have all along. One of my favorite lighting tweaks comes with Tomb Raider 2's Floating Islands level, where the mystical jade platforms floating in the sky now have an eerie green glow that is projected directly onto the character models and surrounding objects. It's a nice effect and never feels overdone, adding a lot to one of Tomb Raider's more bizarre locations. But there's also a ton of issues that the new lighting design introduces too, mainly in how it impacts visual indicators purposely put in place by core design as clues of how to traverse through each environment while also incorrectly revealing secrets or hidden enemies and other objects purposely shrouded in complete darkness before. Take this area in the Venice Tunnels, for example. In the original version of Tomb Raider 2, this interior space is very dark, so much so that you can only really see Lara's boat and the immediate surrounding water surface, along with some of those brick walls. In the remaster, however, there's now a shaft of light pouring in from the ceiling here, and the water surface is much more transparent, very clearly revealing the gold secret dragon statue in the water, effectively spoiling that particular secret. One of the most disappointing examples of this comes with the various jump scares and more horror-oriented moments, where new redesigned ambient lighting incorrectly shows enemies that otherwise would have been totally shrouded by darkness. There's even examples of lights that aren't functioning properly at all, like this upper room in the RX Mines level, where the light switch should turn on these flickering fluorescent bulbs. But in the remaster, those lights are already brightly lit and are not nearly as atmospheric. Like with the gray keys mentioned before, the lighting also hides crucial environmental clues necessary to keep players aware of what they can and can't do. Switches, levers, and even climbable surfaces are often lost in the darkness of certain rooms, requiring players to make use of flares to discover where to go next. This is made even worse by the fact that the remasters, for whatever reason, have no flare hotkey built in at all, regardless of whether you play the classic or remastered graphics mode, and the option doesn't appear in the custom control menus either. These are all obviously significant issues that detract from the original intent of these games, but these are also all the more extreme examples that I found. For the most part, the lighting changes in this trilogy are a net positive for the collection, and contribute greatly to the improved look and feel of each experience. The remaster also adds with it a few changes to the shadows as well, however these aren't quite as impressive as they could be. Because the remaster uses more real-time lighting effects to illuminate its world, a lot of the shadows are the result of light being physically blocked by objects in the environment. Depending on how much light is blocked helps to calculate how dark the shadows should appear on the opposite side. This is a big reason why some of these areas that previously were pitch black now are partially visible, as the small light probes placed in the ceilings are more realistically spread out across the volume. In some cases, you'll even notice more accurate shadow projections of the environment that were previously never there, though sometimes these projections can look a bit rough, with some bad aliasing along the edges that I feel don't really contribute much to their respective scenes. Lara Croft also has a more accurate shadow of herself too, 
though I found this addition to be even more distracting than additive, as it doesn't realistically fade as Lara runs from one light source to the next, causing it to weirdly cut in and out as he traversed through the world. Interestingly, the original disc shadow underneath Lara is still partially visible, only it's more subtle, ensuring players can still use it as a useful guide, without it standing out nearly as much as before. Then of course, we have to talk about the effects. Tomb Raider features a litany of different effects, all of which offer critical information to the player, necessary for both platforming and the combat. Fire effects in particular are extremely lethal in these games, as coming in contact with even a little bit of it will cause Lara to ignite, rapidly lowering her health until she either steps into water or burns alive. In the original two Tomb Raider games, fire effects were represented using crude sprites attached directly to objects and the player, with a cycle of about three frames per animation loop, and no associated dynamic lighting or particles. Tomb Raider 3, however, reworked that fire into being more volumetric, with a plume of red and yellow particles that, when attached to a moving object, would even appear to wave in the wind slightly. It's not amazing by today's standards, but it was a big improvement back then. The remaster collection appears to borrow this same style of fire effect, effectively unifying it across all three original games. The weapon firing animations and effects are also massively improved, with higher resolution muzzle flashes, added bullet impact sparks when hitting solid surfaces, and other smaller details like lingering smoke from the end of the barrels, and bullet casings that bounce off the ground and even impact the water with small ripples. The muzzle flashes will also illuminate the environment across all three games now, whereas the original 96 Tomb Raider didn't have any dynamic lighting of this kind. It's also worth noting here that many of these effects aren't necessarily new either. It appears Aspire took a lot of these effects, or were at least inspired by those, in the last revelation, especially the impact sparks, which seem to have also been added to the metal wheels of the minecart level towards the end of Tomb Raider 3. Finally, there's the water effects. These effects are probably one of my biggest gripes I have with this remaster, as they not only look underwhelming, but are functionally a major step back from the original designs. For one, the surface of the water isn't particularly amazing when compared to the nice textures, object models, and characters. There's basically just a thin animated texture on the surface with transparency applied, with very subtle hints of ripples along the surface. This is pretty much the same as how the water was always designed, only the harsh animated white lines of the ripples before were much more easily identifiable, making it simpler to determine if the surface below a far drop would be safe to drop into. There were several instances throughout my playthrough of all three games where I wasn't sure if I was hanging above a pool of water or not, and I'd even need to swap between graphic modes just to make sure. Sometimes, the water surface also falsely gave the impression of still water, when in fact, it featured a powerful current, a detail that originally was clearly indicated with its own unique water surface texture, as seen here. Even more crippling is the complete lack of animation to these quicksand or muddy areas in Tomb Raider 3. In the original game, these carefully hidden traps had a very subtle wave effect to their surface, somewhat warning players that they're not the same as a typical walkable surface tile. But in the remaster, this is not the case at all, and new players will no doubt be confused and frustrated when they try to play this game for the first time, only to continuously fall through the ground for no clear reason. Like the lighting issues that I mentioned before, the underwater sections of each game are also not nearly as dark. The simulated caustics of the original games made some of these areas a nightmare to explore, adding to that sense of dread as the player's breath bar begins to flash and you lose sense of where you're supposed to go. Personally, I do prefer the remaster in this case. The caustic effects are still there, but they're not nearly as pronounced, making underwater traversal less confusing and ultimately less frustrating. Though, like with the horror reveals that I mentioned before, this does somewhat lessen the impact of big moments, especially the beginning of the Maria Doria levels, where players are left deep underwater with little direction and some hungry great white sharks. It's also worth mentioning that not all the water effects in this collection look bad. In fact, 
the updates made to the waterfalls and river rapids look incredible by comparison. Previously, these types of effects were limited to very basic textures with maybe an animation cycle of about 3 frames. But as you can see, waterfalls are now more three-dimensional, and there's even some cool particle effects around the base of waterfalls that wasn't there before. The river rapids in Tomb Raider 3 highlight this the most, as the entire river seems to be a large collection of these alpha effects springing out from the surface, whereas before, the entire river rapids section was a series of flat animated white texture maps, making it probably one of the more impressive upgrades in this collection. But collectively, the water in the remaster is a bit of a letdown. I don't think the water needed to necessarily be fully simulated and realistic like those water effects seen in the fan-made Open Lara, though it absolutely needs those functional characteristics that the original games featured to make traversal understandable for players. Finally, let's wrap up with an extended sound comparison. Here I picked out a few classic sequences from each game to illustrate how the audio quality differs between the original and remastered versions. For the most part, the audio is the same, with all the same compressed gunshot audio, voiceover work, and that terrible popping sound whenever there's a boulder in the first game. Though they did at least throw in some new reverb effects throughout to add to the sense of space. So what do you think? Which version of each Tomb Raider do you prefer?
And that wraps up this episode of Direct Comparison. Overall, Tomb Raider Remastered is a phenomenal package. The updates here are certainly a net gain for these classic adventures, adding in some much needed quality of life improvements like high res textures, models, effects, and even throwing in some cool changes like the ability to mid air somersault in Tomb Raider 1, a photo mode, and the expansions that many players may have never experienced before. The new modern control scheme is not at all worth using, as the game world is so deeply built around the classic tank controls that giving direct control over the camera with the right stick really doesn't do anything to improve the feel, and in many ways makes the game even more difficult to play. And there are a bunch of issues that I noted throughout this video that can and absolutely need to be fixed, especially invisible objects when using the remastered graphics, and objects that are too visible now, like the invisible floating platforms here, or all those crucial horror reveals that are currently spoiled due to the reworked lighting effects. Sound quality, FMVs, and cutscenes also could have benefited greatly from a total rework, as these have not translated well though they are at least serviceable, and I appreciate the inclusion of all the original assets and content with the click of a button. At the very least, this collection provides a perfectly stable and clean version of all three original games, without the need for cumbersome modding, unofficial patches, and all the other nonsense necessary to get those old DOS box versions working. And for players who have only ever experienced the low-res, warbly textures and sometimes sub 30 FPS versions on the original PlayStation, even the classic mode of the remasters will be a major improvement here. Though personally, even with its faults, it'll be hard for me to justify ever going back to the original versions of these games now. The increased frame rate of the remaster graphics scheme feels buttery smooth, save for a few minor hitches I experienced on the PC, and a crash to desktop that occurs whenever trying to enter Lara's basement in Tomb Raider 3. The collection overall is not necessarily groundbreaking visually, and probably won't have the same impact it had back in the 90s, with its stiff animations, clipping, weird AI, and now with new bugs and glitches that were never there before. But for fans of Tomb Raider's earliest adventures looking to finally have a simple way to revisit the Lost Valley, the Great Wall, and Area 51, this package is a no-brainer. And after playing through all three games, I'd love to see the last two entries, The Last Revelation and Chronicles, be included in some way soon. But what do you guys think? Are you interested in picking up the Tomb Raider Remastered Collection? Let me know in the comments section. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more content like this posted every week.